My name is Joe. Um, I'm afraid I can't speak Chinese. I'm sorry about that. Um, today is actually my first ever day in China. I arrived on the plane this morning. Um, it's a huge honor to be here. And I'm going to talk to you today about a company um, that I work for called Innocent. Um, we are a British company. Um, has anyone here before today heard of, of Innocent? A few, oh wow, okay, a few people. Well, that's good. For the rest of you, hopefully I can tell you something. So, we make fruit drinks, basically. Um, we started off 17 years ago making uh, fruit smoothies. So drinks made entirely of crushed fruit. No added sugar, no concentrates, completely natural, just fruit in a bottle. And now we make juices and coconut water. And we sell our drinks across Europe, but we don't yet sell our drinks in, in Asia. Maybe one day. And before I tell you how Innocent got started, I'd like to tell you how I came to be working at Innocent. So I first discovered Innocent when I was at university. I was in my second year at university, and I was living in a house with uh, four other guys, and we were living a fairly typical university lad experience. And by that, I mean that we were working a little bit, and we were drinking quite a lot. Um, something we didn't do much of was to eat fruit and vegetables. Um, and one of the guys that I lived with at university, his name was Ian, and, uh, and Ian played a lot of uh, a PC game called World of Warcraft, which some of you might have heard of. So he spent all of his time at university in his room in the dark, eating crisps, drinking beer, and playing World of Warcraft. So whenever Ian would go and visit his mum uh, and his dad, he would go back home in between university terms, and his mum would always make sure that she had a fridge full of innocent smoothies, because she knew it was the only opportunity that she had to get some fruit into Ian's diet. So Ian would drink these smoothies, and then he'd come back to university, and he'd be very happy with himself because he'd finally had some fruit. And one time, unknown to Ian, his mum decided to write Innocent a poem. Um, she liked the company, and she thought, you know what, I'm going to write them a poem. So she wrote Innocent a poem that said, basically, thank you for helping me get something other than beer and crisps into Ian's diet. And about a week later, after his mum had, had sent Innocent this poem, uh, from our student flat, Ian was downstairs, and he came shouting up the stairs, going, guys, guys, you've got to come down. You've got to see this. Um, so we went running downstairs. And downstairs, Ian was there with a box of Innocent smoothies that had just been um, hand-delivered by a postman. Um, and inside the box of Innocent Smoothies was this little note. Looks a bit like this, actually. And it just said, your mum writes a lovely poem. Uh, I hope you enjoy some drinks on us. And that was from Innocent. Um, and that had a really big impact on me. Um, up until that point, I had no interest in business. Um, I especially had no interest in marketing. Marketing to me was full of uh, fake stories and stuff that wasn't real. Um, and, but this delivery of drinks and this handwritten note from a company made me think, well, there's a company out there that is trying to do things a little bit differently. Um, and so, long story short, after university, when it came to, to me looking for a job, I ended up looking for a job at Innocent. And I got a job there um, working, actually, as a basically like a customer service assistant. Um, and then over the next eight years, 
I took over our social media channels. I set us up in those places on Facebook and Twitter and, and other things. Uh, and now I lead all of our online marketing uh, across Europe. So that is how I came to be at Innocent. But Innocent actually was started by these three guys. So this is Rich, Adam, and John in 1999. Here they are now, a little older, still just as happy. Not surprising, because they've made millions and millions of pounds. Um, so the three of them met at university, um, became good friends, and they often talked about maybe setting up a business together one day. And they had loads of different ideas of what they wanted to do. And the only thing that really connected these ideas is that they wanted to make something that would help make life a little bit better and a little bit easier. Um, and after university, they ended up getting jobs in London, very well-paid jobs in marketing and business consultancy. But they never let go of that dream of maybe one day setting up a business together. And they kept talking about it, right? They kept go, like, they'd go to the pub, they'd go to parties, and they would keep talking about this idea of, why don't we set up a business together one day? And eventually they decided, right, we just need to have a go and, and do something. So their first business idea um, was the amazing electric bath, um, which is a very, very bad idea. Um, and rather than making life better, <laughs> and easier, uh, the mix of water and electricity was going to make life quite a lot shorter. Um, so thankfully, they didn't pull ahead with the electric bath. They settled instead on fruit smoothies. So crushed fruit in a bottle, less likely to kill people than an electric bath, which was a good thing. Um, and once they had settled on this idea of, of fruit smoothies, they wanted to do some research to find out whether anyone else would actually want to buy their products. Um, they didn't have very much money, so they got together the money that they did have, and they made a load of fruit smoothies at home in their kitchen. And one weekend, they went to a music festival in, uh, in the south of London, a tiny little jazz festival. And they had a little shop at this festival, and they sold their smoothies there over the weekend. And in front of their shop, they had two big rubbish bins, a yes bin and a no bin. And above their, their shop, they had a sign that said, do you think we should give up our jobs to make these smoothies? And then they asked people to vote using their empty bottles. Um, and at the end of the weekend, the yes bin was full. The no bin was almost empty. I think there were three bottles in the no bin. Um, one from each of their mums who thought, please don't give up your jobs to squash fruit for a living. Um, but true enough, on the Monday directly after that festival, the guys went into their jobs in London and resigned and committed to making a go of this smoothie making business. Now what I love about that story, um, aside from the fact that our company started as a result of two bins, um, is the fact that Innocent might never have got started without a willingness to ask people what they think and then to listen to what people have to say and actually make decisions based on that. And that is a, a spirit of being connected to our drinkers that we've tried to maintain um, ever since. And no matter how big we grow, we always want to try and stay small when it comes to actually talking to people and listening to people and connecting with people on a one-on-one -on -one level. So yes, we are now the number one selling smoothie brand in Europe. Um, and we're well on our way to being the number one chilled juice brand. Oh, yeah, a bit louder. Is that better? Have I been completely silent for the entire time? <laughs> that would be depressing, wouldn't it? <laughs> Let's start again. No, we won't start again. Um, <laughs> OK. Yeah, well, there's this fruit company, and anyway, now we're massive and we're around Europe. You get the idea. Um, now, this is our wall of love. Um, it's a giant cork board. It's a big board that sits in the front of our office. So if you came to visit our office, Fruit Towers, in London, 
Uh, one of the first things you would see would be this big board. Uh, and we get sent all kinds of weird and wonderful stuff in the post from our drinkers, from hand-knitted wall hangings. This is a, a hot water bottle holder. Um, we have a hamster coming out of our packaging here. Handwritten letters, hand-drawn pictures, all kinds of, of different things. And that isn't really normal in the world of business. Um, you know, you don't normally get in touch with a business unless you have a complaint to make. Um, now, I want to be honest. I'm not suggesting that every single person who buys an innocent smoothie then runs home and spends three days knitting something for our wall. Um, we do get complaints. Of course we do. But I do think, as a company, we're very unique in terms of not just the quantity of contact that we get from our drinkers, but especially the quality of that contact. Um, we're one of only a few brands that I really know that has a very, very personal relationship with, with its consumers. And I'm going to tell you a bit about how I think that, that came about. Um, I'm speaking very slowly, by the way. Is it, is it helping or is it just annoying? OK? It's OK? Shout if you want me to go quicker. OK. Um, so Innocent was social before social media. Our first social media channel, really, was our packaging. Um, when Rich, Adam, and John first started making drinks, they realized that, actually, they had no money to advertise, a bit like the Vita Coco story earlier. They had no money to go on TV. They had no money to do uh, mass marketing in any way. But we did have our packaging. So we tried as hard as we could to make our packaging as interesting as possible. This says, you should probably try opening the carton at the other end. Um, it wasn't just the fact, we were one of, I think, the first companies to actually talk to people on its packaging. Um, and it, what was especially, I mean, it was weird to have a company talk to you on its packaging 15 years ago. It was especially weird to have one talk to you with such a human voice, such like a normal, non-business, non-corporate voice. Um, half the time, when we write stuff or, or draw things on our packaging, um, we don't even talk about the drink itself. Um, sometimes we talk about fruit. Uh, other times we talk about our thoughts on the meaning of life or space travel or bees, um, whatever it might be. We try and, and write stuff and draw things that we think would be interesting for people to, to read. Um, and back in the early days as well, as well as talking to people on our packaging. We also tried to use it to invite people to get in touch. Um, but again, we tried to do this in a very relaxed and informal way. So rather than writing, uh, if you have a complaint, call our customer hotline, we wrote, nothing on TV, fancy a chat. Um, there's another one that says, bored, question mark. And then we said, we'll pop round to Fruit Towers, or call us, or email us. It was a really, really relaxed invitation for people to get in touch. So just like Ian's mum and the story I told you at the start, people would look at this stuff, would read it, and would think, well, here's a brand that's worth talking to, that has something to say. Then they'd see a really informal invitation to, to get in touch. And then they'd write to us. So well before Twitter or Facebook made it I guess a bit more normal for, or Weibo made it more normal for brands to talk to people. We already had this regular dialogue with a group of, a community of, of drinkers who, who liked what we did. And anytime anyone got in contact with us in the early years, um, wrote us a letter, sent us an email, we would always work as hard as we possibly could to make our response to them as personal and as impressive as we possibly could. Um, you know, I think every single time someone gets in contact with your brand, you have an opportunity to win a fan for life, just with the quality of your response. 
And actually, people's expectations from a company's response are very low. People have very low expectations of how a company can respond. Um, so we would draw little doodles. We would find out people's addresses, send them letters, um, send them drinks in the post with, with handwritten notes. Work really, really hard to make our response an impressive one that would make them want to tell their friends about us. On every single drink we've ever made, uh, we have invited people to come round and visit us at Fruit Towers, our office. Um, burglars, by the way, is an English word for like thieves, thieves or criminals, basically. So that's our invitation for thieves. This is the entrance if you are a human person. Um, and I always thought when I read that on Innocence Packaging, I thought, what a weird thing to do, to ask people to come and visit you in your office. And I thought, I wonder if anyone actually does that. Um, and they do. We have hundreds of people every single year who just come in off the street, knock on our door, and say, can we have a look around? Um, <laughs> And they feel a bit weird. They go kind of like, is this okay? Is this normal? Can I really do this? Um, and if they do, then we will always make sure that someone from the Innocent team, it could be someone in IT, it could be someone in our supply chain team, it could be someone in marketing, it could be our CEO. Someone will take 30 minutes out of their day to walk around the office with them and talk to them about the history of the company. Again, I think it's just a nice example Despite the fact we've grown an awful lot and we now have hundreds of visitors every year instead of a few, we still continue to, to show people around. Because we like meeting people face to face, um, being able to talk to people face to face is the very, very best way you can talk to anyone. Um, so we've put on a few events over the years. We, uh, we started with a free music festival called Fruitstock. Um, which we held in a park in London in 2003. Didn't really know what we were doing, didn't know if anyone would actually come. Um, very worried that it might just be this guy. Uh, but in the end, uh, 30,000 people came along that first year. And in 2006, the third year of, of Fruitstock, we had 160,000 people come to that festival. My all-time favorite innocent statistic is that there were more people who came to Fruitstock in 2006 than bought tickets to Glastonbury, which is Europe's largest music festival. Um, so it gives you a sense of the scale of, of that event. And the best thing about events like this is that we were there. So everyone who worked at Innocent would give up their weekends to walk around wearing t-shirts like this talking to people, actively meeting our drinkers. Um, and I've got a short film here um, in just a sec, Chan. Uh, an event called the Innocent AGM. Um, we've held our fifth one, I think, very last year. It's a very simple event. We use Facebook and Twitter to invite people to come and visit us on a Saturday. Um, we get about 150 people into the office for the day. Uh, and then we have a chat to them about our history, what we plan to do, and most importantly, we get their thoughts on what we should do next. Um, cool. Play that now. Hello. Good morning. Welcome to the fifth Innocent AGM. How are you? Who came the farthest? I'm from Switzerland. Yeah, that's quite far away. <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming, however far you've come. Um, this is my favourite day of the year. I wrote that down earlier and I was thinking, is it really? Or is it Christmas? Or is it my birthday? Or is it some other day? Uh, but I think this is my, my favourite day of the year. But I always get a lot of pride out of seeing people turn up on Saturday to come and see our business. I don't know how many businesses there are in the world where people just turn up on a Saturday to see what will happen. Because you probably don't really know what's about to happen. And maybe you don't really know why you came. And maybe at the end of the day you'll think, I still don't know why I went. <laughs> If you need drinks, we have drinks. They're free. Just, you know, you bought a big bag, then you just go for it. The nicest bit is to introduce my friend. So Richard is one of the founders of Innocent. Um, he's going to take you through the story of how we got here. Hello. 
was myself, Adam and John, we're three friends of university. Uh, Bright-eyed, uh, clear-skinned, bad hair-cutted, 326-year-old. We don't normally sort of say this in public, but he was entirely and utterly inspired by a hangover. After a night out the night before, we just wanted something, we were craving something healthy to put into our bodies and realised actually that's what smoothies do, there's a sort of lovely easy way to do yourself some good. Well, our aim is to leave things better than we find them. And the health of the consumer, the communities in which we operate, the charity partners that we work with. There's just a spirit of trying to leave behind a, a, a net positive legacy. Okay, today was basically my dream coming true. I really love the fact that we could go and have a look through the floors, experimenting with products as well, making the smoothies. So yeah, very happy, very happy. Great. So sorry if you couldn't understand all the words in that, but hopefully it gives you an idea of the kind of event that we like to, to put on and the kind of day that that is for, for our drinkers. Um, so yeah, as a brand, we show people we are listening. Um, it's especially important that we do that as, as we grow. The years of hard work that we put into building a relationship with our drinkers means that we now get quite literally thousands and thousands of contacts across various different contact channels every month. Um, and we get some really, really amazing ideas from our drinkers. In fact, I would go as far as to say that probably some of our best ideas have come from our drinkers. In a way, they do our job for us half the time. I kind of was thinking of earlier today, I wonder how many times, especially on social media, well, certainly in and around Europe that I'm aware of. I wonder how many times the phrase, uh, thanks for your feedback, we'll pass it on, is said. <laughs> and then I wonder how many times that feedback is ever actually passed on to the rest of the business. Um, so something that we work incredibly hard at at Innocent is making sure that we read every single tweet that we get, every single post on our Facebook wall, every email, and we make sure that all of the important bits of feedback are fed back directly to the business. So our customer service team, in many ways, is one of the most important teams in the business. Um, we make sure the very best people that we hire go into that team. Yeah, and we get great commercial wins from, uh, from our drinkers. So for the first 10 years we were in business, every single smoothie that we made had banana in it. Um, bananas are nice fruit, it helps to make smoothies a bit thicker and for whatever reason in our head every smoothie that we made had to have banana in but uh, there are a lot of people who don't like banana um, and so it was only because our drinkers were emailing us and getting in contact with us and calling us and saying look guys can you please make a banana free smoothie it's only because of that that we ever actually made a banana free smoothie and that went on to become our third best-selling recipe. So a very smart move from us that actually it just goes to show <laughs> sometimes the best bits of product innovation are staring you right in the face, but you might miss it unless you listen to, to your consumers. And this is an example. We're doing this stuff all the time. So this is a, a Facebook post from earlier this month. Um, people wanted us to put more strawberries into our strawberries and bananas recipe. So we did, 25% more. And the great thing about Facebook is that we can then promote a post like this and make sure that people know that we are out there listening to their comments and acting on their feedback. And there are few things in my experience that our drinkers like more than to know that their feedback is actually being listened to. But showing you are listening is not just about making new products. It can also be done in more creative ways. So this is a Facebook post uh, that we did um, last year about Blue Monday. Now, has anyone heard of Blue Monday? Maybe not. It's a, it's a British day. It's a very classic British day. Blue Monday is allegedly the most depressing day of the year. Um, it falls on roughly the 20th of January. It's dark, Christmas is over, you haven't been paid yet. Apparently everyone's depressed, but it's a complete, it's a bunch of rubbish, basically. So we did this post, and people liked it, which was nice. 
But Paul Murphy got in contact with us and he said, well, it's also Penguin Awareness Day, um, which is far more cheerful. And we thought that is a lot more cheerful than Blue Monday. So because we have a very talented in-house creative team, um, we were able to very quickly, uh, within an hour, make this and post it up on Facebook and Twitter. So today is Penguin Awareness Day. We're doing our bit, are you? There are no penguins in any of our products, and there never will be. Um, and then we made sure that we said thank you to Paul for, um, for giving us the idea in the first place. Um, and that post went on to be hugely successful on Facebook and Twitter. And in fact, Penguin Awareness Day now trends every year, year after year, on Twitter. So if you see Penguin Awareness Day in the future, um, do thank Paul Murphy, because it was his idea. We share our profits. So we have a, uh, a saying at Innocent, um, which is to keep the main thing the main thing. Um, it's a very simple phrase, but it helps us to stay focused on what's most important. Um, these are the offices of Longerberger. Longerberger are an American company. I think this is in Ohio. Uh, Longerberger make baskets, and this is their head office. So that is a very good example of keeping the main thing the main thing. If you don't keep the main thing the main thing, then you might end up putting an escalator outside a fitness center, um, and that, that means you've lost your way a bit. Okay, so very important to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing for Innocent is to do this. We want to make delicious food and drink that helps people live well and die old. And we want to do that by living and working by our values. Um, our values are massively important to us as a company. I know every or most companies have a set of values. Not every company, I think, <laughs> lives them as strongly as we do. So everyone, you know, they dictate everything that we do from the people that we hire, the things that we make, um, the way we communicate with people, the kind of campaigns we run. Every decision we make in the business has to be in line with our values. And the one at the bottom there, I mean, all of them are equally important, but the one at the bottom there, being generous, um, I just want to talk about that for a second. Oh. Mysterious. Ta -da. Um, yeah, we give 10% of our profits to charity each year. Um, something that makes me, on a personal level, incredibly proud to, to work for, for Innocent. Um, we actually give at least 10% to, to charity each year. There was a year where we gave 48% to profit to charity, and we um, nearly went out of business. So we learned that 10% is about the right amount. We can stay in business, and we can have a meaningful impact. And most of that money that we give to charity goes to support the work of uh, charities around the world who are helping to tackle the problem of hunger and malnutrition, especially in children. Um, but we also give to charity through a campaign called The Big Knit. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about this. In fact, when you leave here today, just outside on the table, you'll see lots of smoothie bottles wearing these hats. So you can have a look at some of the hats. They're awesome. Um, so why the hell am I talking about this? The Big Knit is a campaign that New Adam came up with. So remember, one of our founders was called Adam. So when New Adam joined, he became New Adam. New Adam had an idea one day in 2003. He thought, wouldn't it be good if we could get people to knit us little hats? Um, and we'd get people to knit us hats, and then we'll put the hats on our smoothie bottles, and then when we sell that smoothie in shops around the UK, we'll donate a portion of that sale to charity, and the money would go to a charity called Age UK, and they help to look after older people in the UK. There's around 70,000 older people die each year in the UK as a result of cold, and the money goes towards helping to stop that problem. And he thought, wouldn't this be a nice idea? So he went to Rich, John, and Adam and said, 
What do you think, guys? Um, I think we get people to knit us little hats. We'll put them on our bottles. It will be great. I think it's fair to say that Rich, John, and Adam thought he was a bit crazy. Um, didn't really think it was going to work. Uh, but they said, OK, fair enough. Give it a go. So the first year that we did the big knit, in 2003, we had uh, 3,500 hats knitted for us. Um, and everyone thought, wow, OK, people actually want to knit us hats. So we ran the campaign again. And the second year, we had 20,000 hats knitted for us, all of them hand-knitted voluntarily by real people in the UK. The next year, we had 50,000 hats knitted for us. Then we had 100,000 hats knitted for us. And now, every year, we get just over 1 million hats knitted for us in the UK alone. And we've started to run this campaign around Europe, too. Uh, in fact, uh, let me just show you some of the hats, by the way. This is a pick of some of my favorites that we've had. Um, some of the creativity that goes into these hats is insane. And we run a competition on our Facebook wall to be crowned hat of the year, so people get quite competitive about it. Um, but absolutely amazing. Uh, and since we've been running that campaign, we've now started to run it around Europe, uh, in France, in Scandinavia, in Germany. And in total, we've had more than five and a half million hats hand-knitted voluntarily by real people, um, which has helped us raise more than 3.3 million pounds to, to look after older people, um, which I think is just amazing, really. And to be honest, um, Innocent doesn't deserve that much credit. <laughs> All we do is put the hats on our bottles. It's like real people that choose to knit these hats and that have helped us do that. So that is, ooh. yeah, I'm nearly there. I just wanted to finish by saying that our purpose is to help people live well and die old. But for us, helping people live well is about more than just making drinks. Um, it's also about entertaining people and making people smile with our packaging, with our social media, through the events that we put on. And it's about helping more than just the people who buy our drinks to live well. Um, it's about giving something back and donating 10% of profits to charity through things like the Big Knit. Um, really, our purpose, helping people live well and die old, is as much about what we do as it is about what we make. Um, and I hope, A, you were able to understand some of that, uh, and B, um, I hope you can understand why I feel so incredibly proud to, um, to work for Innocent and why I was very happy to get on a plane and come to China for the first time um, to tell you guys a bit about this company. Um, thank you very much for listening. Xie Xie. This is it, Joe. Presentation, and like. it's a definitely terrific company. And I have a question. I don't know if your company actually has any plan entering the Chinese market. As, and if you are about to enter Chinese market, do you, are you going to change any of the ways you are doing market right now? Because as far as I know, uh, the greater China area is totally different from any part of the rest of the world. And uh, the things you actually mentioned, like hosting a concert, um, that kind of thing, like super personal thing, doesn't really work here as far as I know. Yeah. So are you going to change anything the way you're doing market right now? Yeah, uh, that's a really interesting question. Well, something I would say is that um, this style of marketing <coughs> didn't work in the UK until, until we started doing it. And it, now it turns out it works really well. Um, so I guess... Firstly, we're not looking to move into the Chinese market yet. The main reason for that is that we have made a very conscious decision to expand very slowly. Um, we're, very, uh, we're very protective of the brand that we've created. Um, so it's very important to us that every new country that we launch in, we get it, we get it right. Um, so that's one of the reasons why 
we're choosing to expand slowly. But in terms of would we change, I think every country that we launch in, Innocent has a, changes itself culturally to suit the country. Um, uh, because what works in the UK might not work in Germany, for example, or might not work in France. So we've already become reasonably good and skillful at working out which bits of the brand work best. Um, I think the general approach we take to, uh, to anything, really, is test and learn. So we would try something. We would try something small, just like the big knit. The first year, it was 3,500 hats. If people like it, we'll do it again, and we'll do it bigger. Um, if they don't, we'll scrap it, and we'll try something else. Does that help? Cool. OK, you can ask. Hi, Joe. Hi. Hello. Can you hear? Yes, very impressive presentation. Thank you. I have two questions. I noticed you also launched, uh, you also launched coconut water, and yep. after learning from what Vita Coco has said, I would like to understand your positioning and also how you are going to differentiate uh, as a, like a second or third player um, in in Europe. And then the second question is, uh, I would like to, I'm curious to learn about your expansion plan after smoothie, after coconut water, and what would be the next? Yeah, thank you. No problem. I will start with the expansion stuff. Um, we've already tried lots, again, a kind of similar answer to before. So we've already tried a lot of different products. Some of it's worked, some of it hasn't. Um, we tried making uh, a food product. So it was called a, a veg pot. It was literally a little pot filled with vegetables, which you could put in the microwave. And we did that for a few years, and in the end, we decided that we weren't keeping the main thing the main thing, because the main thing for us was drinks. So we decided, OK, we'll, we'll leave veg pots. Um, the way we work out what we want to make next, I guess it's the same. It's true of, of any company. We work out what we think people want, right? We think about consumer insight. Um, but the most important thing for us is to continue to make things that are nutritionally positive for people. Um, so we look for gaps in people's diets. We look for the things that people aren't getting enough of. 15 years ago in the UK, that was definitely fruit. Now, I think there are different needs. Um, protein needs, dairy needs, omega-3, all kinds of nutritional needs. So, um, so that's how we work out what we want to make next. Uh, and in terms of uh, Vita Coco and how we differentiate ourselves, um, I think we have a very different, um, a very different brand to Vita Coco. Um, I think one of the biggest things that differentiates us is the decision to give 10% of our profits to charity. So that's something that I guess we will focus on a lot more heavily in our marketing. Um, but the same goes for anything. I don't want to say anything rude about Vita Coco because they make a good product and they're a good brand. Um, I just think our coconut water is better. <laughs> I hope that helps. Hi, you in Tioma? Okay. Hi, Joe. Uh, okay. How do you summarize the secret or strategy for building uh, the Innocence brand? brand awareness and uh, to recruit new customers in the early years when you have very few people and very low budget, uh, when, when there are even no social media, how do you do that? And I'm sorry. Second, okay, sorry, yeah, can you, can, let's go one question at a time actually just so I can make sure I, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So what, can you repeat that one just a, a bit slower, sorry. Okay, how do you summarize to be the secret of, uh, innocence, of the innocent brand to recruit new customer and uh, to build brand awareness? in the yeah. early years when you don't have much money or very yeah. or many people. OK. Yeah. Um, I, well, to be honest, there's never any secret to success. There's always many, many, many secrets to success and not one. I think something that we did that other brands hadn't succeeded in doing before was we, we found a way to connect with people on a personal level in such a way that they they did our marketing for us. So they told their friends about the brand. Um, you know, when Ian got that box of smoothies in the post and with a little handwritten note, it made me a lifelong Innocent fan. And it made everyone in that house think Innocent was amazing. So I think, I think, we, uh, I think we just worked very hard on having a meaningful connection with people. 
however we do it. And now with social media, we still work very hard on, we don't just write people a response, we try and have a full conversation with them. Um, I don't know. It's a really difficult question. It's a great question, but very difficult yeah. to answer because... So you, uh, think the, so you think the packaging in the early years is the, is the, is the key for the, for the word of mouth? I think the key is that the stuff we made tasted great, fundamentally. <laughs> like our packaging okay. could have been as funny as you like, and if it didn't taste great, it would have been pointless. But I think the packaging turned us from a drinks company that made a drink that you enjoyed to a drinks company that you felt like a, a relationship with. Um, does that help? Okay. Okay, my I second don't. question is, <laughs> so now since you are a rather large company, so yeah. now how do you allocate your budget or your resources? Uh, say, what's, what channels are you focusing on? What kind of marketing are we focusing on? Or yeah, yeah. How do you allocate your budget or your resources? How do we handle it? Um, well, just the same way that we used to, but a bit bigger, <laughs> basically. Uh, at the start of any year, I guess we work out what's most important to us that year. Um, is it most important that we reach an older audience? Is it most important that we reach a younger audience? Is there a particular product that is more valuable to us this year? Is it coconut water? Is it smoothies? We make those decisions at the start of the year and uh, like anyone in marketing, the truth is that you are always guessing. <laughs> no one ever really knows the answers. So we, um, we do our research and then we make our best guess. That's a terrible answer. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Very nice presentation. And actually, I'm a fan of your products when I'm traveling in Europe. Oh, great. So, uh, I just, uh, my question is about uh, product innovation, especially, especially for kids. So, uh, I know that uh, Innocent has a full line of product for kids. So, what's your um, innovation strategy or how do you do uh, innovations for kids? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not really the expert on it, to be honest. Um, in terms of, I think the thing we are working on at the moment, with kids, you have to keep everything quite simple. So uh, there's no point us making coconut water for kids at the moment and talking about electrolytes and potassium for children because it's just like, shh. Um, the big challenge for us at the moment is how can we help parents get more veg, vegetables into their kids? Um, so kids really enjoy the taste of fruit because it's sweet. So our challenge is to try and make a product, and we've just started to, to work on it now, that has vegetables inside. So it's a vegetable and fruit smoothie, um, but making sure that it still tastes, still tastes sweet enough for, for kids to, to want to buy it. Um, but yeah, I don't make the big decisions around kids' marketing, I'm afraid, so I'm afraid I'm not 100% sure. Okay, hi Joe. Um, hi. Nice to see you. Uh, actually, when I'm in Europe, I uh, oftenly bought your products, and the, the green one, the kiwi one, is the most uh, favorite. The banana free and, uh, one. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, my question is how long the shelf life uh, for the product? Yeah. Oh, about 35 days? So, so that's the 35 same. days. 35 days, yeah. So, it's, it's pasteurized. Okay. So, it's completely natural ingredients, no preservatives added, nothing else. But it's pasteurized the same as, as the Vita Coco presentation you saw earlier. So we gently pasteurize it, um, and that's what helps to extend the shelf life. Well, that and the fact that you, you package it immediately into an airtight container. So there's, there's little chance for bugs or spoilage things to, to occur. The reason I ask that question is because, so if that means the circulation cannot yeah. be that longer distance. Because when I bought the products, I was in Netherlands, yeah. not in UK. Yeah. So um, how you think about the shelf life connected with the, the delivery distance? Are you planning to have longer shelf life products in the future? Yeah. The plan at the moment is to stick with shorter shelf life products. It means that we can avoid using unnatural ingredients. Um, and shorter shelf life products taste better. Um, that's the, the honest truth. 
Um, but you raise a really good point. I mean, and that's another major reason why we haven't expanded beyond Europe. Because if we do, we'll have to, we'll have to hand over, we'll have to start a brand new supply chain. Um, it's very, it takes a lot of time and it costs a lot of money to make a fruit smoothie. Um, if you compare a, a fruit smoothie, which is completely natural fruit ingredients sourced from all over the world to a can of Red Bull, which is sugar, water, and caffeine, um, and they're both sold at about the same price. So actually, although we've grown an awful lot and we are a very popular brand, um, we don't actually make that much money <laughs> On, on the products that we sell. Um, but I think I would rather that we expand with really high quality products and do that slowly rather than expand quickly with, with poorer quality products. And <laughs> ta-da! <laughs> I hope that helps. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.